folk art is it has such a broad um, definition, and it does mean so many different things to different people. Um, you know, what the things that we really like to think about is its impact on community, um, looking at things that are handmade and created by artists um, that have been mentored or are learning things through through their community, um, and it's just. I think that's a wonderful thing about it. It's so varied, um, depending on who you talk to. And that's the great thing about Moifa too, is that we have this you know, opportunity to share so much about um, folk art, whether it's from here in the United States or across, across the globe. And so one of our goals is really to support all artists, all folk artists, whether they are here locally, in New Mexico, in our backyard, or we're working with artists in Sweden or Japan. Um, so it's a really wonderful experience to come to Moifa, just learn more about what folk art is, what folk art means to you as a visitor, um, and hopefully be able to take away something special. So our collections are 160,000 objects. Um, so that's been um, you know, gifted and um, acquired over 70 years. Um, through some of our exhibitions, we do take on loans from other institutions or artists, so that kind of helps um, kind of beef up some of our exhibitions where we may not have things here in-house. Um, so it is, yeah, a little bit of both, but we are actively an actively um, active collecting institution. So actually, we're very, very fortunate in that so many people come to Moifa and um, might be interested in giving collections. Um, so there is some of that research, of course, by curators, and maybe they are doing, um, you know, visits to other countries or working with artists directly. Um, you know, we do have pieces that we commission with artists that we bring into the collection, um, but we have an amazing donor base to that. Um, you know, they might have their own collections they've developed and are interested in finding a, a permanent home for those objects. And, you know, if it's the right fit, then we will take them that way too. I think really being um, even more artist focused um, and community focused, um, be finding more ways that we can support folk artists and making this be a platform um, to share that with the world um, and also being really um, open to having this again be a platform for um, you know even difficult discussions or um, you know things that maybe we haven't really touched upon yet in the years and years that Moifa has been here but there's so much opportunity um, that's kind of untapped that we're really excited about doing, but really just um, being really as inclusive as possible, really, you know, reaching the communities and finding out what people want to see and how we can support, support them. If you ask anybody at the museum, we all might give a slightly different answer, but compared to, you know, how people would describe fine art, which often emphasizes uh, painting and sculpture, et cetera, maybe tapestry coming from sort of a very European context. Um, that might have been people who went to, got specific training, fine art school training, or went and got a degree, or you know, MFA or whatever. Folk art is, comes from the community. You could say it comes out of community expression and whether it's looking at um, using art for religious or spiritual ceremony, festival practices, or decorative art, um, or art that you wear, or art that you cook in, whether it's pottery or textiles or clothing. It's sometimes we like to say folk art is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's often passed down in families or in communities, and you learn it maybe from your uncle or from a neighborhood person. So that that's sort of the distinction, but it's pretty blurry in some ways too, because there are master folk artists who have the skill level and training and artistic talent, you know, totally on par with any fine, fine artist, um, fine art artist. So uh, 
And it's evolving, that folk art is always changing, it's never static. Some people think folk art is just like an old weaving, an old Native American weaving, or it's a you know, particular dress. We're gonna see some Scandinavian dresses from one or 200 years ago, but it's constantly evolving and changing. So in terms of materials and expression, it's, it's always changing and evolving. Since I'm a director of education, we have a huge active education program where we do outreach education in the schools. We do school partnerships where we go into school for six weeks and we bring a folk artist and students will study in depth the particular type of folk art with that folk artist and make their own art. And then we have a student exhibit afterwards of their art. Um, we have large uh, public celebrations coming up. October 30th is a Day of the Dead celebration. So that's a very particular tradition and a lot of folk art comes with that tradition, the paper mache from Mexico, skeletons, etc. Um, and so we do outreach, we do inreach, we do public programs, talks, lectures, celebrations, movies. We have a wonderful YouTube channel where you can go see a lot of interviews with artists and demonstrations. So uh, folk art is engaging and it's for everybody. I think one of the fantastic things is that almost everybody can relate to folk art. It's very accessible and people can think back to a relative or somebody they knew that did a form of folk art practice. This is our one permanent exhibit and it opened in 1982. So we now have the 40th anniversary and it was created and installed by Alexander Girard and he was, he was somebody who grew up American mother, Italian father, grew up in Florence, Italy. He was trained as an architect and also was a fantastic colorist and textile designer, worked for several different companies, including Braniff, uh, John Deere, and Herman Miller Company, moved to Santa Fe in 1982 when this museum opened, but had been an avid, avid folk art collector since he was a child and his father gave him his first nativity. And he had the collecting gene. So by the time he moved to Santa Fe, he had one house to live in and one house full of his folk art. He especially began seriously collecting when he went on a delayed honeymoon with his wife down to Mexico. So a lot of the folk art he loved and saw was Mexican folk art. So he donated 100,000 objects to our museum and spent between two and three years personally designing and creating this installation that we'll go take a look into, take a peek. And that is where he was able to showcase and uh, create all these different visions of folk art for us. And in terms of exhibit design, he even has here in the hallway these wonderful paper theaters he collected. And they were um, something that children played with long ago, <laughs> before any screens were around, and would use these paper, th paper theaters to create worlds. But he sort of emphasized that folk art is partly about theater, and he wanted this exhibit to sort of show some of the drama and the festival and excitement of folk art and how it's using context. So he, there are a number of quotes by him where he said, you know, it's theater, it's drama, and uh, that's how he, he partly created this permanent installation. And you can see his quote up there, the whole world is hometown. So when he created this permanent installation, We'll walk in there and you'll see there's absolutely no label text anywhere. He wanted people just to experience it and to enjoy it. And while he puts a lot of different types of folk art together from around the world, um, he said the most exciting thing for him were the differences. Yes, there are commonalities, but what he finds so interesting about cultural expressions through folk art is, is, are the differences. And that's what makes it so interesting. The museum did talk him into letting us do a brief gallery guide here. So you look at the windows and you'll see numbers. And if you want to know what country it's from or know a little more about the objects. He created this in 1982. It was very unusual. He placed things way up high, down low. Folk art from India, including a narrative scroll painting, which was a specific tradition where scroll painters would travel from village to village often back when there wasn't much literacy in villages, so they could talk about history, mythology, religion, by painting and singing um, the stories that the scrolls represent. 
These are actually all capes from Peru, and they're used in a particular village for annual celebration that, in part, you can look at the stories and the figures on the capes. They're telling the stories of emancipation from slavery. And so that's why the dancers here wear the capes on their back, and the lead dancer will always be a dancer of African descent because it's celebrating the end of slavery in Peru. I don't know the history of how they were collected, how Gerard got them. He collected in a variety of ways by traveling himself to countries. He had people looking out for collections for him. He sometimes bought collections here in the US or as he traveled. And here's just a fun scene he built with these ceramic figures that were created by his brother. So he had a brother who remained in Italy and was a ceramicist. And he just decided, I want to put together a scene with my brother's ceramics. So he built this whole beautiful scene. Sort of a little bit of an Italian villa, but then if you look above, there are Navajo weavings representing the US flag. So he mixed everything up. He just had fun deciding bit by bit. I, his design and creation of this exhibit was very organic and evolved sort of piece by piece. And all these clay and wooden car figures are from Mexico, so he decided to make a big fun band. And this is one of the favorite scenes in this exhibit. It's um, come from Poland, and these beautiful castles or cathedrals are called Shopka, and they are created, if we could turn them around the back, they're pretty much made out of cardboard and tin foil. And so they used to have a contest um, around Christmas time. People would build different shop Shopka, and they would parade them around the town square and then vote on, you know, choose the favorite ones. And Gerard happened to be there for a celebration and decided he wanted to buy many of them. Brought, bought the purchase them, came back, and then again, with all these wood carvings by different Polish artists, created this whole scene. And beautiful paper cutout art. I'm forgetting the correct name of that. But again, a form of decorative art that originally, people even used sheep shears to cut paper out to make. It's beautiful, beautiful art. Now they probably use exacto knives. But it just goes on now. another scene from Portugal. All these figures are from Portugal. So he loved the name of the exhibit, Multiple Visions. He loved multiples of things. And there are stories that he would sometimes go into a shop and just say, I want to buy it all. But then up above are tapestries from India. So he, he loved to mix everything up. And more, more scenes. There's a cute little kitchen scene he designed, mix. And then over here, Doll's Tea Party. So children love this. We put a little bench for kids to be able to stand up and look in. But the level of detail has got, you know, framed little pictures on the wall that have, a, you know, four times seven are 28, if you look closely. And the candles originally did light up. Now they, I think they've it burned out. And then things that people might not really consider folk art, like these plastic transformers from Japan, very early models of transformers. He loved them. He originally wanted to call this a toy museum, and the, the administration back then talked him out of that. And these beautiful old houses, these used to be sold flat. You could buy from Sears and Brobuck, like for 20 cent, 25 cents 100 years ago or more a kit, and they come flat, and then sometimes maybe the paper was on it, or you had to glue the paper on the front, but again, so he had a whole collection of these, and he had to build a little Victorian village. And then here's an incredibly packed scene with so much folk art based on a Peruvian village. And it's sort of celebrating or showing a feast day celebration. Each village would have a patron saint, and so the patron saint essentially would try to protect you, all the villagers, from bad things happening. And it was a reciprocal relationship, so then you celebrate the patron saint in a big festival. But here you can see all these wonderful different types of dancers, and these, these dolls have 
they're a pretty authentic representation of the costumes the dancers would wear. And these wonderful big, it looks like slightly quick at some of these churches, etc. They were actually um, used as sort of protective devices on top of your house. You might buy one and put it on top of your house, and that would protect you from natural disasters mm -hmm. or bad things happening. So they were actually, you know, sold as as a big good luck or protection. You just see so much happening. This was part yeah. of Gerard's determination to kind of show the, the passion and the celebration and, um, you know, the joyfulness of both of these folk art objects representing folk art life. He had beautiful, beautiful stacks of boxes in his house, all very carefully labeled. And some of his favorite boxes were a certain type of beer box. They were very sturdy. So we have some old beer boxes. And he put all the objects in there. But when they put up this exhibit, they did find that a lot of things didn't necessarily have provenance. So that's why you look in this catalog and there'll be some kind of vague descriptions because that's as much as they know. There's a beautiful um, beadwork from Paris, France, and these were used to decorate children's graves. And, you know, a story is that Gerard found one of these being discarded in an old graveyard and asked if he could have it and took it back to his Paris hotel room and scrubbed it in the bathtub. Well, so many people talk about what an excellent eye he had for collection. But then, if you come over here, Gerard loved to put together these little scenes. Here's a bullfight. And then he loved this particular family of ceramic sculptors, the Aguilar family from Mexico. He just loved their figures. He collected so many of them. And here he made a baptismal. As an architect, he was always thinking about perspective to yeah. cockfighting scene you know, over here. from representing a village in Mexico, Acatlan, and he had, there's a particular artist, Heron Martinez, he commissioned to have to create that church. And so he started with that cathedral and uh, the artist's wife painted the outside design, which is a little bit more reminiscent of Aztec design. But then he just had fun putting all, all these figures he collected. Um, two pieces that kind of have a historical significance. This little tiny nativity here mm -hmm. is kind of what started Gerard's collecting. It was a beautiful little wax nativity given to him by his grandfather in Florence, Italy. So that was the first thing he collected and then he just kept collecting so many nativities. Um, he had a whole exhibit once on just nativities. And these were all his grandfather collected these, and some of these go back to, I think, I think I found one 16, well, there's 1820. I thought one up here goes back to uh, 1680. You can see yarn laid down, traditionally it was laid down on beeswax. Beautiful Scandinavian dress, especially from the collection of the museum founder, Florence Dibble Bartlett. And the museum was founded in 1953. And she was a Chicago heiress who was a philanthropist and very much wanted to preserve world folk art, or she called it craft back then, and was very concerned about mass manufacturing. And so a lot of the um, Beautiful traditional dress in here is from her original collection. How traditional dress has changed over the years, there's a lot of specific regional dress, and how now it's even being used um, both as, you know, I belong to this group, I wear this form of traditional dress as my identity, but also to use dress to resist and kind of protest uh, things happening 
in specific specific area. So you'll see the Sami dress in here. The Sami yeah. are the northern tier indigenous people. And um, so they've actually revived their dress and also used some of it as forms of protest mm -hmm. to say our you know, lands are being taken away from us. We don't have the same rights. There's been a very long history of oppression. We are having a woman, an American woman from Duluth, Minnesota, come here end of November and do a hair weaving workshop because she traveled to Sweden and there's a group of women keeping that tradition alive and studied with them extensively and now is trying to carry on the tradition here. Here's a uh, dress designer who, there's the traditional dress on the left, and someone who used plastic bags okay. from Ikea and made a similar dress. We always try to have interactives because with our exhibits so people can sit down and try to get the feel of what it's like to do, for example, some cross-stitching, something connected to the exhibit. So. And this is a fantastic exhibit. Maybe you can go through the ghost house. It's on Japanese ghosts, demons, and monsters. Okay. And the tradition and folklore are going way back hundreds, thousands of years of the folk tales and the stories, anything describing supernatural events or scary things that you can't explain. And it's just come out in such a variety of art in Japan. He's, this is a world of old Edo period painting showing some of the little creatures. We had a young artist from Japan, Kona Junya, who's also a director of tourist studies down in Kyoto at a university there. And he is a major yokai scholar and fan. And he creates these paper mache sculptures. Here's one of a big blue monk he created. And he has, together with his uh, artist collective and students will stage these big yokai events like there's a yokai event that happens in Kyoto called the 100 Demon Night Parade mm -hmm. and everybody dresses up and walks down a particular street. So here she starts way back here, some of the very old scrolls, 1600 to 1800s. Um, this is, I'm sure this is a yeah, printed copy, but you can see some of the original here. Scroll through all kinds of wild and crazy creatures. Once Japanese developed wood block printing and could make, produce many, many copies, mass production of copies, it was kind of the birth of Japanese manga in a way, going way back, the comics, because now they could make books and distribute them as a form of popular culture. So here, there's a display, of some of the very old books going up to contemporary manga. And anybody who's ever watched uh, Miyazaki films, these wonderful Japanese anime, there are several films there that include yokai in them. So Spirited Away is probably the most famous one that has all kinds of you know, ghosts and demons. And here's a mask. It's called a Kagura mask, one of the oldest of the performance traditions in Japan. You can see the kind of a tormented face there had a wonderful master puppet maker make this beautiful doll puppet for our exhibit. And here you see what happens. Sometimes they change it. But if you just um, 
so that's what she will look like when she becomes a, a demon or a monster. Then all these beautiful old prints go back, 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 showing all different kinds of ghosts. There's a whole separate class of Japanese ghosts called yurei, which are uh, women, female ghosts, and usually they're women that were wronged in their life or their husband had them poisoned or something. There are different things, many different stories, and so they come back to haunt. And kabuki is another famous type of theatrical performance developed during the Edo period. Here's a very famous story where the kabuki actor, and then I always play the woman, actually came out of this lantern. And the story is about a woman who was slowly poisoned by her husband who fell in love with a young neighbor and she ended up dying and then coming back to torment and haunt him. And at one point she comes out of a lantern to haunt him. The artist you saw at the beginning, Kono-san, helped to create a little mini traditional Japanese ghost house. They could just be in a, in a town, kind of a more handmade, homemade version. During the summer, and the whole idea is to give you a fright to help make you sweat and, and cool you down. <laughs> but, <laughs> so we were lucky to be able to develop this small ghost house. And here, you can sit here and watch. It has a number of different ghost stories here. So all these ghost stories, you could sit and press a button and watch a particular, like the dish mansionette macho ghost story. So you can see all those ghost stories are pretty great. a shovel or a sewing needle or a umbrella they, or a pair of old shoes when you you know dispose of them they've lived their life if you don't kind of thank them or give them credit they might come back to haunt you like shoes might come back in the middle of the night and start dancing around the house animal creatures that are also supernatural creatures like this raccoon dog or tanuki who can create all kinds of mischief on New Year's Eve and ask parents, have your children been good? And they're holding a big cleaver and they're saying if they haven't been good, we'll take them away. So it can be a terrifying experience for the kids. It's always, you know, different people in the village dress up. The very last exhibit we have is just a very simple one in our gallery of conscience, but it's about masks. So um, when we were closed for a whole year, our curators were busy creating an exhibit from home remotely and they did it on uh, response to COVID, artwork and masks created around the world. So here you can see an, a narrative scroll painting showing different things, uh, interpretations, experiences of COVID. And one of our wonderful uh, master weavers, a family we worked with for many, many years in the museum, the Trujillos, um, Urban has won national Wards, his work is in the Smithsonian, and his wife Lisa Trujillo also does amazing work. She created this for the exhibit, this movie. Here you can see hospital, a lot of closed doors, the isolation that people felt during COVID. So they had actually a uh, contest so from all over the world. Arthur Lopez, who's another master artist, created this altar for the exhibit. 